Hi, my name is Pat Salmon. I'm a Staten Island historian, a retired curator of history, and I'm here today to talk about some haunted tales of old Staten Island. Well, back in the colonial period, you find that there were a number of scary stories coming out at that time, and it's with good reason. Because around the time of the American Revolution, actually at the start of the American Revolution, there were 30,000 British troops on Staten Island. And as you can well imagine, it made the residents of the island pretty nervous. I mean, you know, the, at first they were happy to have the British there, but uh, then things got a little rough with them just taking what they wanted, firewood, pigs, cattle, whatever the case may be. So it got to be a somewhat scary time. Um, and so it's no doubt that two of the stories that we hear about involve the new Springville area. In fact, there was said to be a ghostly dog that used to be seen uh, running about uh, the area of uh, Victory Boulevard where Signs Road is located. The dog was so big, it was as big as some of the horses that were in the area at that time. You know, we're talking 1780s or so. And he was big, and he and he and he growled at people, and he scared people, and it was it was, it was a, very, a very frightening thing. Uh, one man thought he could perhaps get rid of this uh, ghostly pooch, and so he took a big axe. And the next time he was on his horse, and the next time this 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 dog came up to his horse, he took the axe and he whacked at it, and the dog disappeared, and the axe just fell to the ground. In effect, he really did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> to discourage the dog because for many years thereafter the dog was still seen again and he would just disappear as it suited him pretty much. There were also reports of, of, a, of a little girl who used to sit on the rocks in the area where Signs Road now meets uh, Victory Boulevard. And of course, it was called the Richmond Turnpike at that time, by the 1800s, that is. And this little red, uh, this little girl would always have this red cape on and a little hood that was also red, because you know, red is always a very scary color. And she too would disappear and sort of come and go as, as uh, you know, as, as quick as the wind blew. So for many years thereafter, where that intersection is, um, New Springville area where, where Signs Road meets uh, Victor Boulevard, that was always a somewhat frightening location for many people. Not too far from there, a road was built in the early 1800s and it was a new road, so they called it the new road. And it wasn't very well built. As a matter of fact, it was all rocky and boulders and overgrown bushes and, and such like that. And there was nobody living on the new road, except for a man named Hank Vanderveer. And as you could tell, he was an early Dutchman here on Staten Island, although we are talking 1800s. Well, it seemed that um, Hank was sometimes referred to as Hank Shelm, but people didn't say that to his face because the translation of Shelm was rascal, and he was a kind of a, a proud man, and he didn't particularly like it when people called him a rascal. Well, Hank lived in a little hovel, shall we say, with his daughter, whose name was Nauchi. Nauchi and he lived there. As I said, there was nobody around. A couple of times, though, people, gentlemen callers, did call on Nauchi at the house, but she'd have none of it. She would just take uh, the nearest thing, uh, an oar for a boat, and she'd chase them out and down the block and down the street until they were out of sight and pretty much let them know she didn't want them around. Well, it seems that Nauchi also used to wear 11 bloomers all at the same time. And she never removed them to launder them or anything like that. And so the outer bloomer, which was a blue one, got terribly, terribly, terribly filthy dirty. And um, she, as I said, she continued to wear this all the time. Now, it seems that 
Hank passed away. And it wasn't too long after Hank passed away that Nauchi also passed away. And it seems that on many a moonlit night, the, the people who actually moved into New Road in New Springville, they claimed that they would see the dingy, dirty blue petticoat that Nauchi always wore out and about in the community. Now, well, Nauchi's dead, but the petticoat is still walking around. And of course, this was especially true on moonlit nights. So for this reason, New Road eventually was referred to as the Petticoat Lane. And there were many accounts of this blue petticoat being out and about. Now, it seems that Hank's house, which laid abandoned after both of them had died, and the blue petticoat were both struck by lightning one night in 1862. And it wasn't until that time that people could actually go into Hank's old house. It seems the lightning had killed off the ghosts that were, uh, had taken up residence after Hank and Nauchi died. And the lightning also struck the old petticoat. And so we didn't see the petticoat again after that date. Now, it should be noted that the old petticoat lane, which we also see on old maps of Staten Island from the 1800s, is now known as Rockland Avenue. This particular story was actually published in the Richmond County Gazette on April 2nd, 1862. We find a number of these interesting ghost stories in the old newspapers from that time period, but there was a book published back in 1925, and it was called Legend, Stories, and Folklore of Old Staten Island. It was written by a man by the name of Charles Hine and William T. Davis, our very own historian and naturalist who we all think so highly of. They documented a number of very strange experiences on the North Shore, especially at a place called Old Place. Old Place, if you, obviously, we all know where the Gothel's Bridge is located. Well, where the Gothel's Bridge Toll Plaza comes in, that was pretty much the Old Place area. It was a very uh, active spot for spirits and ghosts and things of that nature. And they tell a few stories about encounters that people had in certain residents. It seems that there was an enchantress living at uh, the old place. And the neighbors wanted to get rid of her. I mean, she was, you know, it was just a terrible, terrible situation. So they thought that if they had a, somebody with artistic talent draw her picture and then nail it up on a tree, and then they brought in an expert marksman with his shotgun, they thought if he shot at the picture that it would kill the enchantress. But it seems that it didn't. He shot the picture, shot the tree, they went to her house, and there she was still, still having her evening meal. But Old Place was, was uh, continued to get odder and odder. It seems that at one point, children were getting the measles. Pigs were not putting on weight. Women were dropping their stitches and cream was souring far too quickly. These were very disturbing events. Um, so disturbing, in fact, that they blamed one in particular neighbor. Um, many insisted that she was indeed a witch. And taking matters into their own hands, the villagers organized and set a watch on her house to observe her one night and see what she was doing and all what they saw. It seems that the witch left her house, of course it was a she, and she left the house without a broomstick. So that was very suspicious <laughs> to the neighbors. But they found some other um, things going on as they watched her. They saw that she headed to the Old Place Creek. Here she stopped on the shoreline where the black waters coiled and bubbled. In the shoreline mud, she withdrew the skeleton of a long dead horse 
whose dried bones rattled on the midnight air as though signaling to fiends that were known to frequent the marsh rivulets on the New Jersey side. She crawled into the cavernous ribcage of the rotted away beast and she sailed without any apparent effort across the sound, across the Arthur Kill River, and she vanished among the tall grasses that grew along the banks. No one knew if she went to meet the devil or other spirits like herself, but all were glad to see her gone because she never returned. And all were not surprised that she went to New Jersey because everyone believed then, as now, that New Jersey was full of fiends. Sorry, New Jersey. The story is from legends and stories and folklore of old Staten Island because, as you know, you can't make this stuff up. Now, the, the hovel that she formerly occupied was given over to the owl and the bat, and until its last stick rotted into the ground, the place was known to be haunted. For long years thereafter, shrieks and curses could be heard on foul nights coming from this desolate location. The devilment continued at Old Place. It seems there was a woman who lived there, and her name was Case Bowen. She was a known gossip, liar, and a thief. And of course, again, she was a woman. The women don't get a break back in these old stories. Uh, villagers were further upset that she was out and about in the nighttime when honest inhabitants were at home in their beds asleep but they were afraid to say anything. They were afraid of Case Bowen. No one wanted to combat her, especially when she was in a rage. But there was one who was not concerned with Case Bowen and her moods. In fact, one night, dark and stormy night, the devil himself met with Case Bowen. As a powerful lightning bolt flashed, it revealed the devil tearing out Case's tongue under a pepperidge tree. And with that, Case was never seen or heard from again. Another story at Old Place has us, uh, has the Reverend Dr. Kennedy. He purchased a, a, a low sandy place and he built a little hovel <laughs> at this location. And it seemed that he just used bits and pieces of materials he found, old flotsam and jetsam that was out and about, old pieces of wood and stone and rocks. He was a very frugal man. He gathered together bits of terracotta and, and even used a, a paste to, to uh, put in the, the, the open areas of this, this building. And he made burnt clams. He burned clams in order to make the paste. Um, when the project was complete, Dr. Kenny brought his wife and his two daughters to live in the house. According to uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Hine, one daughter married and the other fell off a nearby railroad trestle. Odd. After Dr. Kenny died, he was buried at Hillside Cemetery, which is still um, active today somewhat on Richmond Avenue in Graniteville. Um, after his death, though, this house that he built stood empty for a long time. Subsequently, travel travelers would hear the screams of a woman emanating from the structure, but all were too frightened to go into the building and, and investigate what was going on. Eventually, an artist named Kelly and his friend decided to live in the empty old house. It was not a pleasant place as the chimney was blocked, so whenever they set a fire, the smoke would come back down the chimney and into the little hovel. One night, there was a ferocious rainstorm, and water was streaming into the house through the makeshift roof. The next thing, Kelly and his friend heard screams, and they were so frightened, but it didn't last for long. When, they, uh, when, when it began again, one of the men took a pistol out of his pocket, pointed it up the chimney, and shot way up there. When they looked up into the chimney the next morning, um, they realized that 
uh, there really was only the screaming was coming from a piece of tin that had been placed at the top of the chimney in order to keep the wet out. So it was really the, 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 the tin was getting ruffled about by the wind and that was what was making the, uh, the screaming noise. Uh, closer to uh, where we are right now at the Noble Maritime Collection, there were, was a doctor that used to have a house. His name was Dr. Samuel Mackenzie Elliott. And he lived over on uh, Elliott Place. And he was an oculist. And this was, I mean, we're talking 1840s, 1850s here. And he used to operate on people's eyes um, before there was any kind of anesthesia. If they were lucky, they would get a shot of whiskey or a shot of scotch, but that was, that was the most that he could provide. What he would do, he'd put his patients on the floor, and he would put, his, put their head between his knees, and he would kneel over them and operate on their eyes. Now, that's scary enough for a Halloween story, I, I would think, but even more, it seems that one night, Dr. Elliot, his wife, and two neighbors, very famous neighbors, in fact, Francis and Sarah Shaw, they were having a seance. And they, uh, you know, uh, decided that they were going to see what was causing a rapping noise in the house. And by the way, the house still stands. And by the way, it was not located on Elliott Place. It was located on Delafield Place. Anyway, they were going to investigate the rapping noise that they heard on occasion. So they told the spirit this one dark and stormy night, that if it was from the world beyond, uh, would they please rap once to signal the letter A, twice the letter B, three times for the letter C, and if they would spell out their name. And this way they could figure out who the spirit was that was living in Dr. Elliot's house. So the spirit actually did tap out its name using the system that they had developed. But the, the name came back to be all consonants. So well, Mr. Dr. Elliot realized the name of what, it's all consonants, and he figured out it was his grandmother who was inhabiting the house. And I guess she had a very unique Welsh name where they only used consonants. Well, there's more. There's always plenty more. As a matter of fact, there was a ghost in Graniteville during May 1879. It seems that a David Decker and his three daughters were living in a house. Um, and the three daughters had a room over the kitchen and uh, they kept hearing strange noises and odd sounds. When the girls reported this information to their father, he responded by saying, oh, it's rubbish, it's nonsense, it's poppycock. Well, a few days later, the young misses refused to even enter the room. They were so disturbed by the noises that they heard. They claimed that the spirits were moving the furniture too, and their bed that they slept in was lifted clear off the ground. To prove them wrong, uh, their father, David Decker, and several neighbors uh, from the Baptist Church in Graniteville spent a night in the room. At the sound of the ghost, one of the neighbors called out, in the name of God, have you had trouble in this house? If so, knock once. There was a single knock. Wood then asked, his name was Captain Wood. Captain Wood then asked, were you murdered? There was another single knock. Captain Wood and the other men, including David Decker, were all sitting on the bed when the bed was lifted four inches off the floor, not once but 20 times, all left the room horrified, proclaiming, yes, the girls were right. David Decker moved his house far away. Now, this house was owned by the name, uh, was owned by a man by the name of Mr. Crocheron. And um, he responded to all this talk. He said, you're all a pack of fools. And he refused to believe that there was any manifestation occurring on the property. But get this, it seems like reporters from the, the, the New York Herald newspaper and the Daily Sun newspaper in Manhattan found out 
about this instance of ghosts in this granite fill house. And they decided that one of them decided, actually, the guy from the New York Herald said he wanted to spend a night in the house. So he did, and as did Mr. Crocher and, and a few of the, 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 the local village lads who lived there. And actually, Mr. Crocher charged each of them a dollar a head to spend the night in the haunted house. Um, it was a sultry night, and from a distant marsh came the shrill and lonely sound of frogs calling. All was silent in the house as the men waited and waited. Soon they heard footsteps coming through the hall, then up the stairs, then someone was approaching the door, then the person opened it. But he was just one of the neighborhood village lads who had stayed outside to keep an eye on things. Mr. Crocherin, Crocherin was very glad that no ghosts had appeared that night, but he was distraught that he hadn't charged them all $5 apiece for having stayed in the house that night. One thing we do want to note is that that house in Graniteville was actually across the street from the Houseman Cottage. And the Houseman Cottage, you may recall, was where Captain George Houseman's wife and daughter were found murdered on Christmas night in 1843. So people were rather creep creeped out about the Graniteville area. Well, in my historic research, I've come across a man by the name of Edward Reinhardt. He was an awful man. He lived on Broad Street in Stapleton, and that is now called, uh, uh, that excuse me, that was called Gore Street. Now it's called Broad Street. He had a little candy store. He lived there with his wife, who was a very kind and lovely lady. Um, but it seems that he got a notion that he wanted to be free of this wife, so he killed her. And he packed her in a barrel, and he put the barrel on a wheelbarrow, and he pushed the wheelbarrow up to Silver Lake, and he buried the wheelbarrow in the muddy banks of Silver Lake. And it seems that a month later, a bunch of boys who were tending some sheep came across the wheelbarrow because the mud had, you know, washed away. And they reported it, and the police found it. They found the body, and they eventually uh, arrested Edward Reinhardt for murdering his wife. And he was brought to the old town jail in Richmond, uh, Richmond town that we know today. And he was kept in the jail and he was put on trial at the third county courthouse that still stands today at historic Richmond town. And don't you know, he was found guilty. And because he was found guilty, they hung him by the neck until he was dead in January, 1881. But the story doesn't continue there. He was buried at Silver Mount Cemetery across from Silver Lake. And um, sometime around during mid-March 1881, a local undertaker by the name of Daniel Dempsey, who was very well known in the Staten Island community, swore that he saw the visions, the visage, the ghost of Edward Reinhardt standing alongside a barrel on the Victory uh, on Victory Boulevard. At that time, actually, Victory Boulevard was called the Richmond Turnpike, but I'm just referring to it as Victory Boulevard, so you know where I'm talking about. Dempsey was not only startled by the apparition, so was his horse. His horse reared up. And don't you know that four days later, four other prominent Staten Islanders also saw the ghost of Edward Reinhardt on Victory Boulevard at Zebra Avenue, not too far from Silver Lake. At one time, there was a series of apartment buildings that stood on what we now call Bay Street at the bottom of what we now call Victory Boulevard. There is actually a key food standing at this location. It was called the Baltimore Flats. Now, this is not a very old story. This story only goes back to the 1960s. Uh, it seems that there were four, uh, four flats, as I mentioned, and there was a man who lived in one of the apartments, and his wife worked at night. 
he worked during the day. His life was very difficult. The man was exhausted because he would constantly hear walking in the apartment upstairs from his apartment. And it really scared the heck out of him. So, you know, he was left alone at every night because his wife went to work. So he couldn't sleep and he would leave the building at the, at, during the night and he, and he just was having a terrible, terrible time of it. There were... It was really odd because the apartment upstairs was even padlocked. Um, it was a haunted building. Uh, the walking w eventually did quiet down, but then a spiritualist moved into the neighbor uh, neighborhood of the Baltimore Flats. And this seems to have disturbed the ghost because the ghost started walking back and forth again. Eventually someone brought in a priest who performed an exorcism on the apartment. And it seems that after that, the Baltimore flats were nice and quiet after that. There was a boat called the Mohawk. It was uh, said to be one of the largest yachts that was ever built. And unfortunately, something bad happened on the Mohawk. And most mariners believed that if something bad happened on a ship, that the ship would be inhabited by ghosts or plagued by ocean monsters or other phantom ships or sea serpents. So unfortunately, the Mohawk set sail right off Stapleton on July 20th, 1876. It's just supposed to be a, a, a little a boat ride around the New York Harbor. This Mohawk was owned by a man named William Garner and his wife, Mary. They were very, very well-off people. He owned mills throughout the state of New York. And they, they, they actually lived in the building that is today owned by uh, Richmond University Hospital, that old Second Empire building that stands on Castleton Avenue right next to the hospital there. That was their home. Anyway, the Mohawk took off that day. And there was a many other boats in the, in the harbor waters off, off of Stapleton. And the other people in the boats and the other captains of the boats noticed that there was big black clouds forming over New Jersey. It seems, though, that the captain of the Mohawk didn't realize that these black clouds were forming and he didn't do anything about it. Whereas the captains on the other ships started to pull in the sails because wind and sails, strong wind and sails from a big storm don't always get along. To quote the New York Times, to the surprise of everybody, the Mohawk left its sails all spread, thus presenting a broadside canvas to the wind, which could hardly, which could hardly fail in the event of a squall to capsize the boat. Onlookers were astonished. They couldn't believe the captain wasn't pulling in the sails. One of the other captains on one of the other ships even sent a small boat out to tell the captain the storm is coming, pull in your sails. But before the little boat got there, the, the Mohawk took, a, took wind to its sails and the whole boat capsized. The yacht went under the rolling waters of the New York Harbor, lightning, thunder. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy because it seems that Mrs. Garner was um, under the deck at the time the, the boat went sideways and water started rushing in. And at the same time the water rushed in, Mr. Garner went down to save her. So they both drowned in the bottom hold of this boat. Also, there was also a cabin boy, they said. It was only 15 years old, and he too was drowned, as was Mrs. Garner's brother. His name was Frost Thorn. Oh my goodness, there was an investigation held at the new Brighton Village Hall and Coroner Dempsey looked into the whole matter. And actually the captain, whose name was Roland, Captain Roland was actually placed under arrest. And But Captain Roland argued that nobody would have died under the, under the bottom of the, in the deck below if only the furniture in the deck below had been secured. It seemed that there 
there was all this large furniture. And when the boat went sideways, the furniture trapped Mr. Garner and Mrs. Garner, so they drowned. Oh, my goodness. It was, uh, it was a terrible time for the captain, Captain Roland. He went to his death swearing that it wasn't his fault that the, the Garners had died or that her brother had died or that the cabin boy had died. He actually lived here at Sailor's Snug Harbor and he even died here on August 14th, 1903. Who knows? Maybe this was his room we're in right now. Um, it seems, too, that uh, the ship, the Mohawk, actually was taken over by the United States Coast Guard Survey. They renamed it the EGRE, E-A-G-R-E, -E, and it seems that members of this ship's crew swore that the spirit of the sailing master of the Mohawk could be seen rushing on, on the deck of the ship in a futile attempt to loosen the sails and save the ship. Another old Greek revival building that once stood, stood near where St. Peter's Church is today. Originally, it was called the A.M. Proud Fit Home, but by 1907, it was known as the Harding Mansion. Now, there were many who claimed it was the site of unexplained mystery. One resident of the house related that every day at 12 noon, a daytime spirit, a female ghost, descended the, descended the staircase, then continued walking through the hall next to the dining room. The swish of her silk garments were always heard, and this further verified her presence. It was a daily event. No one ever saw the ghost, but one brave member of the family stood at the bottom of the staircase one day at the prescribed time that she always walked down the stairs, and he distinctly felt the movement of the silk dress against his ankle. This restless spirit was also very busy at night. She was often heard clattering around a stateroom that was always locked. There was also a bedroom next to the store, uh, stateroom, but no one, absolutely no one would sleep in that bedroom. It seems too that at one time there was a haunted swamp at the Fingerboard Road. Uh, Ira K. Morris wrote of a ghost tale that he discovered in a newspaper called the Staten Islander in 1854. It seemed that a murder occurred at a location which was called Roguery Hill, so named because it was a dastardly place that was known for numerous robberies and finally for this murder. The road that passed over this area became known as Roguery Hill Road. Today, we know it as Fingerboard Road. And the wetland that's nearby that we know as Brady's Pond in Grasmere is also the site of an historic haunting. Originally, it was known as the Haunted Swamp. The, the Brady's Pond that we know today was created by building a dam alongside a railroad embankment. Anyway, it is the same haunted swamp that is connected to Rogery Hill. David Lotterette, if you play golf, you're probably familiar with the Lotterette house that is up at the Lotterette golf course. It was, the original house was built in 1836. It seems that um, in 1928, the Lotterette family sold it to New York City Parks, and they turned the area into a, a golf course, which I know many of you go to on a regular basis. Um, it seems that, um, according to Ch uh, Charles Hine, as recently as 1913, David Lotterette's apparition was observed by at least two individuals who visited or lived in the ancient structure. 
One mother and daughter were so terrified by the ghost that they fled the house in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. On another occasion, an elderly man was viewed sitting in the parlor of the Lotteret House. He was observed by a temporary resident who was not knowledgeable about the previously sighted vision by the, the two women. He innocently asked, who is that that's resting in the, in the parlor? When investigated, the individual was gone, but they realized that when they got a description of the man, it was a description of David Lotterette. The Austin House Spectre. Oh, what a splendid old home the Alice Austin House is. A story uh, came to us way back in 1895 um, telling us about the sturdy oak beams, the rafters of cedar, and the shingles on the exterior of cypress wood. It was a very solid house, and it still is today. Um, as you know, it's located at the end of Highland Boulevard, and it's right on the water looking over the Narrows, and you get a fabulous view of the Verrazano Bridge. Well, it seems that back in the time of the Revolutionary War, there was a, 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 a British Army soldier who seems to have fell in love with a local woman who was um, part of the patriot cause, shall we say. She was part of the American cause, the cause for freedom. Uh, we don't know her name. It has not survived the ages. I mean, we're talking well over 200 years ago. Um, but she would have nothing to do with him. His heart was broken. He was so in love with her. So, so distraught was the young man that he wrapped a rope around one of the parlor ceiling beams at the Austin house, and he hung himself in the middle of the night. It was declared thereafter that the tread of military boots and the clinking of spurs could be heard. As a matter of fact, the jingle of the spurs would sound as they did the night the young soldier took his life and his body swung from the rafters. Oh, scary stuff. The Fenimore House. The Fenimore House was built in Princes Bay. Again, back at the time of the Revolution. Remember, the Revolution was a very scary time on Staten Island. There was an old fort called a Redoubt built. And on top of the old fort, excuse me, was built this Fenimore House. 1840, it was occupied by Mr. Fenimore his 17-year-old daughter, Eva, and their 12-year-old son, Ned. Uh, because Fenimore often had pressing business in Manhattan, he often left these widowed children at the residence with his housekeeper and two servant girls. One night, as dusk approached, the two servant girls entered the sitting room where the housekeeper, Miriam Allen, and the 17-year-old Eva were sitting. They had their bundles over their shoulders and they declared they were leaving this house. They were frightened. There was strange goings on in this house and they refused to stay a minute longer. And with that, they fled the house. Um, it seems that that same evening, there was an awful storm, lightning, thunder, the works were going on. And the boy, the young boy, Eva, his sister, and Mrs. Allen were sitting huddled in the parlor when all of a sudden there were three quick raps on the front door and they so scared they didn't move. And it was pouring rain outside, so the guy who was out there came running in. He walked in. He was about 30 years old. Um, he was neatly attired. He had a riding crop in his hand, and he stared at the two women. His surprise was a response to the look at the terrified faces on Eva and Mary, uh, Miriam's face. They thought it was perhaps the specter of uh, the housekeeper's dead husband. It turns out her husband had died in the fort that had previously been on the site where the Fenimore house was located. It was a quite a frightening night. And finally, they realized that the man, 
whose name was Frank Darrow. He was a fine man. He was a good man. He wasn't there to harm them. He was just escaping the elements. So they allowed him to spend the night in the house. But Eva decided that his door, his bedroom door, should be blockaded that night. So his room, it seems, was at the top of the stairs. So Eva and Miriam, the housekeeper, placed a heavy wooden chest in front of the door. Not content that it was blocked enough, they put a dining table in front of the chest. Even though the day had been fraught with all kinds of excitement, Eva fell right to sleep, but it was not a relaxing sleep. She dreamt that Darrow burst through the bedroom door with a gun and a sword, and then a, he was followed by a band of skeletons. It all were invited to, by Miriam Allen to enter the room, so Eva screamed in her sleep. No sooner had she awoken from the scream that she heard this horrible noise. It seems that Frank Darrow had also heard her scream, and when he tried to leave his bedroom, he knocked over this huge blockade and it went flying down the stairs. All laughed in the morning at the events of the previous nights. And it seems that even the serious housekeeper laughed. And it further seems that Eva, the 17-year-old girl, and Frank Darrow actually fell in love and were later married. For our last story, everyone knows the conference house. It's at the end of Highland Boulevard in the Tottenville section of Staten Island. Well, it was built in the 1660s, and it was built by the Billup family. Um, now, if we, we move ahead in history a little bit to the time of the Revolutionary War, we find that there's a second Christopher Billup living in the house. He has taken a beautiful young wife. She actually grew up in Perth Amboy. They're living in the house, but she is not a happy woman. She sits and gazes across the Arthur Kill River at her former hometown of Perth Amboy, and she thinks about her youth and the joy that she had in her youth. And she's a very unhappy woman. But even so, she's going about her business of her life. She spends a lot of time in the garden of uh, the Billup house. And she enjoys taking care of the roses and the lilies in the garden. And that's one of the pleasures that she gets. Well, uh, something else started to happen at this time. There were many soldiers and officers of the British Army stationed on Staten Island. And some of them stayed and lived at the Billup House for quite a long time. And other times, Christopher Billup would invite soldiers to, to stay and they'd have a party, you know, have drinks and good food and dancing and, and things of that nature. Well, at one of these parties, it seems that the Mr. Billup's wife or came, came down the stairs in a beautiful dress. It was her wedding dress, as a matter of fact. Her hair was piled high. She was a beautiful woman. woman. And all of the men at the bottom of the stairs stopped talking to look at this beautiful woman walking down the steps. And this really made Christopher Billup mad. And it seems that Mrs. Billup locked eyes with one particular uh, soldier. His name was Harry Farley. And uh, you could tell that there was quite a spark between them. And Christopher Billup noticed it too. And he demanded that the soldier leave the house immediately. Those were the days of hot words and flashing steel. And soon the moon shone on the glint of crossed swords. Billup and Farley were going to fight. Mrs. Billup was horrified and she stepped between the two men and she announced to her husband that he might stop this moment, visual moment of passion that was shared between the two of them, but he would not, st he would not stop future moments of passion between the two of them. In fact, they would oftentimes meet clandestinely at night and dance out in the gardens outside of the Billup house. Um, the future, though, arrived very quickly because during the Revolutionary War, shortly after he met Mrs. Billup, Harry Farley was killed in action. And when he was gone, so was Mrs. Billup's heart. It seems that he was killed at the Battle of Monmouth Heights in New Jersey. 
Um, Shortly thereafter, what occurred too at the Billup House was the, was the peace conference. And the peace conference was unsuccessful as we know. But many years thereafter, there were people who would often speak about seeing Mrs. Billup and Harry Farley dancing a minuet out in the gardens of the conference house. Thank you for watching our video, and I would like to ask that you go to noblemaritime.org forward slash now, and you'll see and learn about other videos. Thanks so much.